Um, so welcome to the last lecture of the EVO seminar series this semester. Our guest today is Dr. Carl Lippo, who's going to be presenting some really fascinating research on the history uh, and evolution of Easter Island. And with that, I will give it to Carl. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I'm a um, I'm an archaeologist, um, and uh, archaeology you didn't you don't often associate it with evolutionary biology or sort of evolution classes, but in fact, archaeological stuff is really well suited for studying uh, in terms of an evolutionary framework, uh, and and there's incredible gains to be made by using evolution as a means for studying humans over time and studying the human past in in the recent sense, not in the sort of gets into the, the biological deep sense of that time. Um, a lot of archaeological work, you know, in sort of the, the Holocene is, hasn't been done with an evolutionary mind, uh, or, or I should say, not with a Darwinian evolution mind. Most of it's been done in terms of cultural evolution, which is a wildly different thing than what we've probably, what I think you've been talking about in this class. Um, cultural evolution in an anthropological sense typically means uh, a vitalistic change, people adapting to uh, external stimuli. Uh, it assumes sort of an intelligent actor, a rational based actor. It aligns itself pretty well with sort of traditional economics with uh, sort of uh, economic rationalization. Um, the idea that people br build themselves up um, and uh, flourish as a result of their own initiatives is a very, is a vitalistic idea uh, that is really rife in anthropology and quite different than what you get from a Darwinian approach, sort of a very different set of assumptions. Both of them use the word evolution, but they mean very, very different things. It's often important to distinguish this. Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about um, a case of evolution, uh, Darwinian evolution, in the context of Easter Island, an, uh, an island that's pretty famous for some really extraordinary things. Um, there's a lot of things that people think they know about the island uh, that come from uh, this, largely from this vitalistic Lamarckian um, uh, progressivist kind of uh, mindset uh, that has sort of biased our understandings quite a bit. Um, it means that we think that people, um, we sort of have rationalizations in that framework uh, for why we think Easter Island is the way it is. And um, what I wanna show you is a little bit as, as we start to study the actual place itself and the archeological record, we get a very different understanding, uh, but that leads to very interesting um, ideas about how humans um, uh, produce variability that leads to different outcomes that can be explained within a Darwinian evolutionary framework. Uh, it's radically different than uh, the traditional notions in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, both empirically as well as conceptually, but uh, hopefully you'll see the power in that uh, in this example, because I think it goes beyond just telling a story about the past but actually learning about the mechanisms that drive the past the way they did, that then we can use in the future. Because obviously, if we're gonna study the past as an archeologist, um, just for the sake of the past, there's very little point in doing so. I mean, in the sense of, yeah, it's great. We could make, tell stories about the past, but who gives a crap? I mean, those people are dead. Um, what do they care? What we wanna think about is how do we use that knowledge that we can generate from the past, from the archeological record, and use it to, to shape our future. I think that's where we can show that archeology span and evolutionary frameworks do it in archaeology as being particularly important. So uh, that's a little preface for where we're going to go here today. Let me jump over to the talk here. Oops. Get up the first slide here. Well. <clears throat> All right. So I've been working on Easter Island for about um, um, past, oh, now it's 18 years, uh, so, uh, quite a while. Um, and um, I, I went to Easter Island as a place to study, really to sort of study the, the sort of the narrative. Um, how did this island come to be the way that we think it did? Um, I didn't didn't go out there to sort of challenge ideas. It really was sort of thinking that, well, I could potentially look at this island. My colleague, Terry Hunt, who's at, now at the University of Arizona, we went to the island to look to, to see, in fact, could we could we understand how the the what people thought was going on, how that started, and how it played out? So I'll have to give you some background on what what that is, and et cetera. Um, one of the things that we do here at at, at Binghamton, um, and, and sort of the idea that that um, I just was mentioning the fact that archaeology, anthropology, and studying the past can potentially uh, give us insights into the future, 
uh, is in the area of sustainability. Uh, sustainability is obviously something increasingly of interest to people. Uh, you know, communities and people around the world are wondering, how do we do stuff in such a way that we end up being existing in the future? How do we not destroy ourselves uh, in the act of what we're doing? And sustainability is kind of the rallying point around, sort of the new environmentalist rallying point, which is basically saying, how do we design systems uh, in which we're part of those systems in the future uh, versus going extinct? We're no longer, you know, the, the, our in the environmental world, and I'm, I, I'm a director of the Environmental Studies Program, uh, is no longer just about saving the whales. It's really about saving ourselves. And sustainability is the way we sort of think about that. So we have to define sustainability. What do I mean by sustainability? Uh, what it is is really how do we go about meeting the needs of the present without sacrificing the needs of the future? Uh, really just thinking about what we do today in the context of what's what are the outcomes, what are going to happen in the future, and how do we make sure we're part of that community, um, that future? What we look at here in particular at Binghamton is this issue of sustainable communities. It isn't just about an individual or a practice. It's about how sets of functionally integrated and interacting populations can work together in order to persist over the long run. Now you think in any community in our today, wouldn't you wanna be part of a sustainable community? You wanna be, be in a community that is functionally active, functionally integrated, uh, functionally uh, interacting with one another and um, sustainable, in other words, lasting through the long term. That's sort of, you know, a common goal. We don't often build our communities that way, but that is really something we are increasingly starting to think about. How do we do that? Um, I should mention that sustainability isn't just to go back here. Uh, isn't just about the environment. It's also about social uh, issues, social equity, uh, access to resources. It's about economic uh, equity, the sense of the distribution of resources across the population, in addition to the environment. So there's three. The three E's: environment. Uh, equity, social equity, and uh, economic equity are part of sustainability. So it's a broad spectrum of issues that you need to think about in terms of bringing communities together for the long run. Well, what are the challenges for creating sustainable communities? I bring this up because um, in the end, we're, we're going to see a case in Easter Island where communities, we can see that communities actually solve problems that are pr were pretty extreme uh, and did so in really innovative ways. But these problems that they face in Easter Island um, are not unique to that place. Uh, they're exaggerated there, as we'll see, because of the nature of the island. Uh, but these are problems that we face today ourselves, like for here in Binghamton, uh, in upstate New York. <clears throat> we might have, for example, limited resources, right? If we don't, if not, if there isn't infinite resources, there's finite resources. Uh, those resources might be, you know, extremely limited, but fragile, uh, might be, uh, and those, we're going to depend on those. And as long as we, if, if we don't use them well, they're going to go away, and that could be a problem. Uh, one of the problems that I'm going to mention in a second is uh, an issue about these resources. They're often common pool resources, meaning that these are resources that um, have access from lots of different people in the community where it's difficult to sort of put barriers to entry. How do we go about using resources that everyone can freely use but without allowing people to overuse them, uh, causing problems for everybody? Uh, we often live in fragile and uh, social and natural environments. That um, The idea here is that... Um, there's certain resiliency and adaptive capacity within communities and within the natural systems. Um, and we can stress them in particular ways, use resources, but how do we do so in such a way that don't has massive effects on it? And this is, of course, the big concern about climate change is the fact that are we reaching a point at which uh, we can have radical impacts on the global environment uh, that we can't reel back from? Because uh, once, they, once you know, the ice sheets melt, uh, there's a lot of heat that is going to take uh, many, many millennia to, 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 to change. Um, historical lock-in. One of the issues with human communities, well, and, and natural, any natural population, uh, is the fact that people and critters uh, like to do the things that they did. That, you know, we, we are uh, beings of habit. Uh, and if we want to create communities that are sustainable, we have to, have to change the way behavior occurs. And of course, no one wants to do that. Everyone wants to live their life as though uh, whatever they're doing was perfectly good uh, and justify and rationalize and fight for it. But, you know, if we're thinking about changing futures, we have to think about changing our behaviors. And one of the problems is, how do we do that? How do we convince people to change their behaviors? Uh, and we also have to build a system, and increasingly this is important, uh, that's, that is resilient to change. Um, and if you think about the, the challenges with climate change, uh, and, and really just the future in general, uh, is that fact is the, that we, the future is really unknown and, and increasingly unknown. Uh, we, we've effectively, through our own actions, have broken the future as a way that uh, Charles Strauss, a science fiction writer, has written it. Um, our own actions have led us to a point where we actually, it's harder and harder to predict what even the future would be like, in, even in a technological sense. Uh, and that hasn't been the case for most of human history. Most of human history, 
um, life from the next 50 years is almost identical on a day-to-day -day basis from life from the previous 50 years. Uh, we know that's certainly not the case uh, now. Uh, and it, has, it hasn't been the case for in the recent history. Uh, since we've broken the futures. How do we build systems that are capable of dealing with the magnitude and the rapidity of change that we know is coming? Uh, that's a challenge. And that's an evolutionary challenge. That's a challenge that requires us to think about the nature of systems and the nature of variability and the selective environment that shapes particular kinds of outcomes. Uh, so it's an evolutionary question. One of the big challenges for, for uh, dealing with natural resources, and, um, uh, and this is sort of where, where a lot of sustainability issues come in, is the fact that the resources we're trying to protect, the ones that keep us alive uh, or keep a community going, are ones that are common pool resources. That's basically resources that are uh, natural or human-made resources that communities benefit from their use. Take a very simple example, air. Air is, we don't control air, or we breathe it, but the actions of people who access it and, and add stuff to the air can affect everybody in the community who use it. So we get um, problems caused by uh, certain individuals leading towards a deg degradation of the entire community. Those are common pool resources. Water is another good one. Fisheries are a great example of um, common pool resources. They're difficult to control and they're easy to overuse. And, and sort of the classic story of uh, common pool resources um, and, and sort of the fear of common pool resources is that they, we can often overuse them leading to catastrophe, uh, basically what's called the tragedy of the commons. I'm not going to go into detail here, but we can, an example of this is uh, the collapse of Atlantic cod stocks off the east coast of Newfoundland uh, over the past hundred years. We can see, you know, if you look at this graph on the, um, on the uh, uh, left, on your left, uh, the, um, uh, uh, Carl, I don't think your screen share is on. Not on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh that hasn't helped. <laughs> did, did it ask me? Oh, I wish you had told me that before. So I haven't talked a long time ago. So I don't know what you've seen, just me. Yeah, we've just been seeing you, which is oh. nice. You've got a nice face. All right. Sorry. Uh, before it, what do I do? Oh, here it is. There you are. Damn it. Okay. All right. So, um, so here's that list of different things, limited resource, comfortable resources, fragile social environments, historical lock and vulnerable change. Those are sort of the issues we have to deal with with sustainable communities. Um, common pool resources are those that are, are shared, um, uh, that communities use, access uh, groundwater, air, fisheries. Uh, and and the overuse of these resources comes from, um, uh, you know, it creates this pop possibility of what's called tragedy of the commons. And th this, this graph here shows the, what happens over time uh, what can happen over time and what did happen over time uh, with overuse, overfishing of a particular natural uh, uh, um, group of cod here. A uh, hundred years of relatively sustainable use, slightly increasing over since 1850 to 1960, but with really mechanized industrial fishing, uh, we have massive catches, which ultimately then deplete the sort of the base sets of critters that live out there and destroy the environment in which they're living, leading to entire collapse of that stock. And that's tragedy of the commons, essentially, the actions of selfish few, in this case, you know, corporate fishermen um, and industrial fleets, ruin it for everybody. And, and effectively, the cod stocks are gone, uh, have made only teeny tiny recoveries, uh, but but uh, maybe gone forever, as far as we know. So that's tragedy of the commons. And that's what we worry about in terms of common pool resources. Uh, how do we not do this? Uh, and that's really sort of the main challenge about sustainable communities. So. Uh, so if we're thinking about the creating communities that are sustainable, and, you know, using an evolutionary framework, we have, there's sort of three key questions here. So, uh, so if we're thinking about, yep. Sorry, keep going. Somebody had a question. No, I don't believe so. Okay. All right. Um, uh, how do we shape? So three quick questions. How do we shape our communities such that they can meet the needs of the present without sacrificing the needs of the future? Which is simply, how do we define? Um, how do we create communities that meet the definition of sustainability? That's sort of an opposite. So how do we do that? Um, how do we mitigate uncertainty in resource productivity? I mean, that's that's that probably one of the big challenges, especially as we go into the future, where more than ever, the, the resources that we require to survive are uncertain, whether that's water, quality of water, the amount of water, the amount of rainfall, when rainfall occurs, uh, where rainfall occurs, uh, is becoming more and more uncertain. And how do we build systems that are sustainable despite the fact that we know less and less about what the future is going to be like. Um, how do we manage common pool resources, particularly common pool resources, where benefits and costs are shared by all community members? 
what that sort of means is how do we create systems that encourage individuals to act in group beneficial ways and not exclusively selfishly? I mean, there's a lot of reasons why people act selfishly, um, you know, because of course they have benefits directly, uh, but how do we shape it such that people see benefits in sharing? And really that's what a community is about, uh, where people are willing to share information and resources because in fact they get better benefits out of doing so uh, than acting self exclusively selfishly. To answer these questions, I think one of the, the, the way in which we can do this is using uh, evolutionary experiments and case studies. In other words, we can use studies of the past and studies of communities that have been sustainable as a way of, and, and look at them with an evolutionary framework uh, to try and explain why they have been successful over the long run. So we can use the theoretical framework that's developed within at broadly within Darwinian evolution uh, and the empirical world in cases where we have sustainability or failure of sustainability as ways of learning lessons about ourselves. Uh, and then that gives us ideas about the future. These case studies will allow us to look at the necessary and sufficient configuration of events and conditions that came together to allow communities to successfully persist over the long run. Uh, and that's where archeology span is particularly important. Uh, we have all these case studies. In fact, human history is literally a laboratory of experiments that humans undertook uh, unwittingly, um, for our, that now for our benefit, uh, that we can look at to see, well, what worked, what didn't work, uh, what was able to survive, and why was that the case? Uh, we can also, we also need to start to develop better methods and, and models for analyzing communities and tracking differential success through time and over space. Um, those are now a big challenge. You know, we, we don't necessarily have all the tools we need uh, to do this, but certainly we have great ideas about where to start uh, and, and uh, lots of case studies that we could do this. So it's in this context, I think, anthropology and archaeology um, in general, can provide a lot of benefits to understanding sustainability, uh, particularly understanding sustainability through an evolutionary framework. We have the right time scale, the right spatial scales, uh, and we, we study communities already. Uh, we just haven't done so necessarily from this kind of perspective. But I think this is where there's a tremendous potential and growth available. Now, one of the things we have to recognize when we study ourselves is the fact that our descriptions matter. Um, one of the big challenges with studying ourselves is the fact that we've got a lot of common sense ideas about ourselves. We think about, uh, we rationalize our behavior in terms of our own common senses, uh, and that we use that common sense in order to tell stories to ourselves about why such and such a thing happened. So if we look at, um, we ask questions. So when we see it like um, on East Round, you, know, you might see a giant statue there. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you, and you would ask yourself, well, why would anybody make a giant statue? And you would tell a story like, uh, well, it's because um, that those were their gods. And then you would be satisfied with that explanation because it made sense to you. That doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it, uh, a powerful explanation, but it's certainly within your common sense. It's easy to settle for that common sense. Um, and Lewinton really brought, uh, uh, Rich, um, Richard Lewinton uh, really made this point clear in this particular quote, which I like to use in any archaeology class, is that we need to think really carefully about the nature of our, ex our descriptions such that we can then go and explain them. So describing the world in a way that's explicable is the first step to building an evolutionary explanation. And we haven't necessarily always gone out and described the world in a way that can be explained. And he basically said, we cannot go out and describe the world in any old way we please, and then sit back and demand that an explanatory and predictive theory could be built on that description. Uh, there's nothing more true about that statement than human endeavors. We have infinite number of stories that we tell ourselves, uh, lots of traditions of kinds of stories that we tell ourselves, whether that's functional adaptationism, uh, whether that's postmodern, um, you know, uh, deconstructionism, uh, whether that's just simply cultural narratives, uh, all of those are different ways of explaining, but they're not necessarily explicable. They don't jet, they don't lead to something that being explained, particularly within a science framework, uh, which is what we're trying to achieve here. So uh, we need to think about that. And, then, and, and we'll see that, in fact, in Easter Island, building that description is incredibly important because we've too long had the wrong description leading to no particular explanation in the end. So Rapa Nui, uh, Easter Island, uh, can we use this Set, set this up to, to learn about our future. So we're going to look at the past, but the idea here is that we're going to learn about we're going to learn about the past in a, in a way where we can generate knowledge uh, that is going to be useful for the future. Now, Easter Island, I don't know if anyone knows about it. It's a pretty famous place. Uh, is really in the middle of nowhere. It's way out in the middle of the Pacific, uh, the southeast corner of Polynesia, uh, um, far you know, twenty five hundred miles from um, uh, the coast of South America, two thousand miles from any other speck of land. Uh, there's this tiny little island called Rapa Nui. It's, uh, Easter Island is sort of the, the word that um, uh, most people know it by. Native populations who are living on the island today the, um, call it the, the island Rapa Nui. Uh, and it's, this, it's a tiny island. It's 2,500 miles from South America. 
about 12 by 8 miles in, in size. It's just a tiny speck of land in the middle of the Pacific, in the South Pacific, about 27 degrees south of latitude uh, out in the middle of nowhere. And then this is the entire island. We get to the island. This is what you would see. Uh, over in the left-hand corner there is the airstrip. Um, it's actually a, a massive airstrip uh, that was created for the space shuttle to land on as an alternative landing site. Uh, so some people ask, how would you possibly even land on the island? But there's actually a huge airstrip. Uh, the left side has a town, a modern town called Hungaro, where people live. And there are native populations living on the island, as well as Chileans. It's, own, own, uh, it's a Chilean part of Ch territory of Chile. Uh, but most of the island is this open territory, a volcanic island. Um, uh, and, and that's when you get there, that's it. It's 12 by 8 miles or so. The size of the island, uh, when, I, if people don't know where it is. I don't know if you guys have been to Binghamton. Uh, we can compare it to Binghamton itself. If we look at, take Binghamton, Johnson City, Endicott, and um, uh, Town of Union uh, together, it's basically the size of East Island. This is a tiny, tiny space. Uh, if you and imagine, if, if you were in this small community of Binghamton, Johnson, uh, Endicott, um, but yet it was surrounded by thousands of miles of ocean, you would get an idea of the size of it. It's, just, it's a teeny, tiny little place. It was actually encountered by uh, Polynesians uh, in the 13th century. Uh, in the 13th century AD, 1200 AD, um, populations coming from central Polynesia uh, voyaged out into the remote parts of the Pacific and discovered a whole bunch of different islands. At this time, people encountered Hawaii, first colonized in Hawaii, went to New Zealand, uh, the Marquesas, the Austral Islands, uh, and Rapa Nui, or Easter Island. Uh, they did these with voyaging sailing canoes with a remarkable technology uh, of, of voy a systematic long distance voyaging. Uh, and they systematically found like, literally all the specks of the Eastern Polynesia uh, sometime during the 13th century. So this is when humans first get to the island. Europeans get to the island much later, 500 years later than, than that, uh, on Easter Sunday. And this is one of the reasons why it's called Easter Island, is because Europeans arrive on the island on Easter Sunday, and they call it Easter Island. Uh, the Dutch uh, captain, Jacob Rogovin, uh, uh, is the first or European to, to, that we know of that just found, describes the island. Uh, and he gets there, and he's quite surprised to find people on the island. Uh, he was looking for a small sandy island that was uh, spoke, reported by some pirates. Um, instead, he encountered uh, Easter Island or Rapa Nui, 1722. Well, what's amazing about this island, it's teeny tiny and remote uh, in the middle of the Pacific, is it has massive, massive statues on it, constructed statues built by the prehistoric people on the island. Um, these massive statues called Moai uh, are are any one of them is an incredible monument, but on this island, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, these things are huge. They, they range from uh, a couple of meters in high to, th to nearly um, 10 meters in height, uh, a three-story building in height of, of statue. Uh, and, and you can get a sense here um, of the scale. All of the statues that you often talk about as heads of East Island are actually full bodies, full statues. That's not been a surprise since the 19th century, um, even though every once in a while there's an internet meme that goes out. Uh, that people like to to send out saying, oh, did you know they had bodies? Well, they all, everyone knows that um, since for hundreds of years. Uh, but when you do excavate the ones at the quarry, you see the entire body. These things are really, really massive. Um, they often sit on these also massive architectural structures called Ahu. Um, this is Ahu Tongariki, a particular place on the south coast of the island, uh, a large, massive platforms upon which the statues were placed. So not only did people make these statues, uh, but they made giant platforms and then put the statues on top of these platforms. So an incredible, incredible things going on in this island that in the in place you would least expect it, this tiny little speck. And not only are there giant statues there, but there's nearly a thousand of these giant statues. Uh, that's what's pretty incredible about it is that it isn't any one of these statues would be a world monument in any other location, uh, say Binghamton, uh, which would be a place that people would come from you know, all over to visit, but on Easter Island, there's nearly a thousand statues. It's just sort of mind blowing in the scale and magnitude of the architecture on this island uh, that was made by prehistoric people. And that's really what's blown people's minds, Europeans over time is how is this possible? Why would anybody do this? What the heck is going on here? Uh, and so it's, it's a really spectacular place. Well, one of the stories um, that gets, that's been told about Easter Island is the fact that statue construction and the resources required to move statues is something that isn't adaptive. It's maladaptive. Uh, that and that you know, and we kind of sense to it, if you look at our own self, look at reflect on our own selves that we often do things uh, that are bad for us uh, simply because they have short-term gains, even though there's long-term consequences. Uh, and and this th this 
story has, has been told in a variety of different ways over the centuries about Easter Island, uh, but made most famous by uh, Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, in which he argues that uh, Rapa Nui is the clearest example of society that destroyed itself by overexploiting its own resources. In other words, that people did stuff, made statues, they consumed resources, the consumption of the resources ultimately led, because of the finite size of the island, led to an entire collapse of the ecosystem that upon which people survived, leading to a population uh, disaster. And he calls this ecocide, essentially people destroying themselves by destroying their own environment. And here is uh, uh, actually an actor, Jason Scott Lee, who's not Rapa Nui, uh, from a, uh, a film shot of Rapa Nui, a, a film that was produced by Kevin Costner on the island, which is a terrible movie, but uh, filmed on Rapa Nui. Um, where he's sitting on the, the, the tree stump they, that they've cut down, wondering, why did we cut all these tree stumps down? We just destroyed ourselves. Uh, that's a common narrative uh, um, about Easter Island. And it's been, and, and Jared Diamond really made this quite famous. So here's the collapse narrative overall, this sort of famous story. The idea here, and this is true, we do know this, uh, that the island once had a native palm forest on it. Uh, these palms lived uh, 500 years old, uh, you know, 500 years or so. They're probably related to the Jebea chiliensis, the Chilean wine palm that now grows on the coast of Chile. Uh, huge palm trees uh, that we know existed on Rapa Nui uh, at the arrival of humans on the island in the 13th century, but at some point um, went away. Uh, we know populations get there. We know have that archaeological evidence that people get there in the 13th century or so. Uh, that's the earliest known dates that we can... Uh, uh, that we know of c colonists being on the island. Uh, once people get to the island, they do what people do is make more people uh, and populations grew over time, presumably consuming resources. At some point, people start to make moai. And again, we know this because um, uh, we can see the statues. There's bunches of them, there's nearly a thousand. Uh, and, and it's often described as a moai mania, the idea that not only did they make statues because it's culturally appropriate, but they went crazy making statues and, and demanded of their you know, chiefs and people in the community demanded even bigger and more statues. And over time, that mo monia mania, moai mania led to increasing consumption of resources and then ecological destruction. Uh, and it kind of, you know, from a story sense, that kind of makes sense. You know, if you made a lot of statues and um, it consumed resources, then those resources in a finite place are going to go away. And it's, it isn't too far-fetched to say, oh, that's probably why uh, that would easily lead to the loss of the resources altogether and ecological destruction. One, um, one of the, uh, from historical narratives, uh, there's arguments that that the ecological destruction resulted in warfare. People out of resources started to fight one another uh, and even engage in cannibalism. People are so hungry that they were chowing down on uh, each other um, in order to for survival. And that is ultimately what uh, led to this collapse. And, and when you look at the island, historically speaking, and this is basically 19th century, uh, you see an island that's been pretty devastated by something. Uh, there are no trees on the island whatsoever, uh, or I should say, uh, there are no palm trees on the island whatsoever. Um, there are small, scrubby other things. Um, there's statues are all knocked down. Populations are pretty small. Uh, and you can infer that potentially, maybe this is the outcome of this, this story that leads to this collapse, collapse uh, landscape. Uh, and that's what Jared Diamond basically argued. The whole thing here ties together this idea that people would do something that's pretty maladaptive uh, that leads to their own destruction in the form of this Moai mania, that making more and more statues is described as causing a downward spiral of cultural regression. Now, it's important to understand the words here, the downward spiral of cultural regression, uh, as not being Darwinian, because Dar Darwinian evolution doesn't have a direction. It just There's just change. Uh, the idea of downward spiral of regression is really one that you can hopefully see is connected to cultural evolution in an adaptationist, vitalistic, progressivist notion, uh, something that's quite different than evolution in a Darwinian sense. Uh, because um, if, you, if, if you see that change occurs because people bringing themselves up, you can see that people can then bring themselves down uh, as a result. So the, those people, those people on the island did things that led to their own destruction. Uh, and the question is why? Well, that's sort of the framework in which my colleague Terry Hunt and I went to the island uh, in order to sort of try to figure out, well, how did this unravel? How did this start this way? Certainly when people first got to the island, they didn't uh, get there in order to destroy it. They got there thinking we're gonna have a healthy and happy life on this island, but somehow, things got caught up 
into what this MOAI construction and resource consumption, and that led to downfall of some sort. So that was when my colleague and I, Terry Hunt, went to the island. That's, what, that's the mindset we had, trying to figure out some of the details of this story. Well, through the work that we started there and over the past now 18 years, uh, we started to learn quite a bit more about it. In fact, we learned things that we didn't, we thought people knew really well, uh, turned out not to be known so well, um, and that there wasn't evidence for, and it really started to re retell the story. We needed to actually go back to the archaeological record to figure out what actually is, is the evidence of the narrative of the history of this island, uh, and then that because that's the only way we're going to actually understand why these stat these statues were built and why the island looks like it does. There are five things we now know about Rapa Nui uh, that we're talking about. First, uh, the nature of prehistoric collapse. Uh, we're going to see is fact there never was a prehistoric collapse. There certainly were events that occurred as a result of Europeans arriving. Uh, and that's that that explains a lot. Uh, there's a lot of terrible things that happen post contact. Uh, the effect of Europeans on the island uh, is pretty devastating, like it is across most of the Pacific and really all the places in which Europeans encounter previously isolated populations. And this is just part of that larger story uh, that we get a better. We, we learned quite a bit about population size and structure. Uh, and that, you know, what we thought required large numbers of populations and in, in dense uh, occupations really wasn't the case. Uh, we learned a lot about the natural resources and the fact that the island um, is, it doesn't have, it can't support a lot of people to begin with. It never could. Uh, and then we learned a lot about the Moai itself, the technology required uh, to make and move these statues. And I'll talk, I'm just going to briefly go through a couple of these points here just so you get an idea of the, the reason why we have this new narrative and that why this new narrative is really the basis of building an evolutionary explanation because it's actually tied to the actual history versus a story that was concocted. Uh, what we've learned about the population is that um, the populations at contact, the first time Europeans encounter the populations, is they see about 3,000 people. Uh, Jacob Rogovine or uh, people shortly after basically see about 3,000 people on the island. Um, that number is slightly smaller. Uh, Gonzalez, um, the Spanish who come in 1770s, uh, uh, sees about 2,000 people. Uh, over the next few years, we see actually smaller and smaller numbers. They waver back and forth, depending on the observer. Uh, the early observers were never systematic thematic in their descriptions. Uh, but uh, over time, we start to see fewer and fewer people uh, until uh, till late in the late um, 19th century, uh, censuses were, were taken, and populations are shown to, to decline uh, you know, precipitously until there's in uh, 1877, just 111 Rapa Nui people living on the island. Um, now, what we know is, and this is well documented, uh, the loss of populations at this point over this period of time from contact to the 19th century uh, is a result of disease. Uh, disease impacts has a huge impact on populations, uh, and we can see wave after wave of disease going through and wiping out the population. These are previously uh, isolated populations from Europeans. Europeans introduce diseases for which these people have no uh, defenses. That leads to a sort of a, a catastrophe, a demographic catastrophe. And we can see that um, really across um, the Pacific and across uh, North America and South America as well. We can also look at the statues. One of the evidence of this collapse narrative is the fact that when Europeans arrive on the island, they see, at least in the 19th century, they see an island uh, that has statues all fallen down. And most of the arche archaeological record on the island looks like this, with statues of the thousands, thousand statues. Most of them are fallen down and look like this. And the, the argument, sort of the assumption here is like, well, this is uh, the result of collapse, that people ran out of resources, they got angry at each other, and they knocked all their statues down because they were so hungry and needed resource. When we look at the evidence, we actually see something quite a bit different. Uh, at 1722, when Jacob Rogovine first arrives, we actually see all of the descriptions that he makes and, and the people around him make um, are that the statues were standing. They describe statues as how, talk about how tall they are. They draw them in a standing position. They talk about the hats that are on top of them. These are called pukau. Uh, so th there isn't any description of fallen statues at all. Uh, Gonzalez, the, the Spanish captain, is there in 1770, also doesn't describe a single fallen statue, though he describes plenty of other statues and talks about how tall they are. Uh, it isn't until James Cook, Captain Cook, uh, the English captain in 1774, who first describes toppled statues. Uh, and after that, we start to see more and more descriptions of statues fallen and fewer and fewer descriptions of statues standing. Um, in 1804, uh, the Russian Lejansky talks about 20 standing statues, describes like, oh, there's just 20 left. Um, oh, 1825, uh, all of the ones in Cook's Bay are described as toppled. Eight standing statues in 1830, four standing statues in 1838. And by 1868, some point between 1838 and 1868, there are no standing statues whatsoever. So what we can see from the historic evidence, the fact that statue at contact 
the statues that are at these ahu were largely, as, as far as we can tell, standing. Uh, that these were all upright statues, and that the landscape that people are describing as collapsed is really a post-contact landscape as a result of the events that happened after Europeans got there. Now, once Europeans get there, they introduce diseases, they introduce slavery, uh, they they take thousands of people off the island, slaves to work in as Peruvian domestic workers. Uh, they introduce uh, economic goods, they change um, all kinds of things, that people abandon statues entirely, uh, beginning with the arrival of Europeans. And what we're misinterpreting as being collapsed really is just the consequence of the interaction that Europeans have with the prehistoric environment. So uh, we've really misunderstood that whole na nature. We also have evidence that human populations were never particularly large uh, during uh, uh, prehistory. When we look at the archaeological record itself, and this is what archaeologists do, is we go out there and we actually map things and try to look at the density of artifacts uh, to try to understand domestic units and the scale of domestic units uh, and sort of community scales. Uh, we start to look at these and take, say, take the south coast chunk here. Um, what we find is um, not giant mounds of village debris, uh, which is very consistent with high density populations where you have efficiencies of people aggregated together and using the landscape around them to produce food in order to support that population. Instead, what we see is a dispersed landscape individual artifact and small dispersed uh, uh, domestic activity dispersed across the landscape in a continuous fashion. Uh, they, this, this activity seems to be centered around um, Ahu and, and Moai, and those are those red uh, rectangles that you see there. Uh, but otherwise, the domestic economic activity is actually scattered across the island in a low density, relatively low density, continuous fashion, and not something that's it's consistent with high population aggregation um, that we see elsewhere in the Pacific as well as around the world. So it doesn't seem to be ever have been a large population. In fact, we might actually, we could conjecture at this point that 3,000, the people, the number of people that Rogovin sees may be about the maximum number of people that could be supported by the island. Now that's backed up by the fact that when we look at the actual soils themselves, um, that we find that they were always poor in nutrients. They never were particularly productive and could never support large populations. Uh, the idea that, that they could have supported large populations and people arguing about large populations usually comes from the fact that they say, well, it must have been tens of thousands of people in order to have made and move all those statues. Well, that's certainly a possibility, but when we look at the, the nutrient levels of these soils, we find something wildly different. The, the soils were always very, very poor. In fact, the only way that populations could survive on the island over time uh, is actually to use what's called lithic mulch gardening. Uh, lithic mulch gardening is an incredibly labor-intensive method for slightly enriching your soil by breaking off chunks of bedrock and exposing the, the soil to new uh, surfaces of bedrock, uh, allowing uh, uh, phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen uh, to get into the soil so you can grow plants. And this, what you see in this figure here, is, is actually a, a prehistoric lithic mulch garden. Just looks like a pile of rocks. Uh, and in those rocks are um, are growing, actually at this point, taro, uh, that's still growing in those fields. Uh, this is across the landscape. Now, Europeans initially get here and they go, they wonder where the farms are. Where is all the land that supported all the people that they assumed must have been there? Of course, what they don't see is the fact that the farms are actually just piles of rocks uh, because that's just not the way we farm as Europeans. Our European style farming, generally speaking, that's actually, we also do lithic mulching as well, uh, really usually means removing the rocks from the fields so that you can grow stuff. But on an island in which the, the resource where soil nutrients are very poor, you need to enrich the soils. Uh, and you only can do that with the nutrients that are available. And those are available in, in the volcanic rocks themselves. So all the little rocks that you see here, um, every single one of them is actually an artifact, a broken rock, broken by people, placed there in order to enrich the soil. This also captures moisture uh, and prevents wind erosion from the from the sea. The main crop that's able to grow there uh, it appears is sweet potato. Sweet potato is a crop that's brought from South America at some point uh, late in, in, in East, Eastern, Poly 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 Eastern Polynesian prehistory, uh, becomes the dominant crop for the resources. The nutrients on this island are sufficient to grow sweet potato. Uh, when we look at mulch gardening and do some measurements of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, we can see that the, you know, sort of document the fact that those lithic mulching actually does increase slightly the amount of these of these critical soil nutrients that allow plants to grow. Uh, there's a slight growth of, you know, phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium in the areas that we see lithic mulching. We also learned a lot about the, the moai themselves. Now, a lot of the assumptions about moai movement come from the fact, uh, um, are related to the fact that there must have been a lot of resources, both in terms of people 
and uh, wood and other things that were required to move the statues. These are massive things. Uh, a 30, 30, a 10 meter statue or 30 foot tall statue uh, can weigh up to 70 tons, essentially the weight of a 747 uh, that people are somehow moved uh, using prehistoric technology. Now, from a European perspective, you might think, how is that possible? They must have, either there were aliens, which of course, we know that's not the case, because uh, we can see the prehistoric people's tools that made them, um, or they had lots and lots of people. Because from our perspective, how would we do it? We'll either get a machine, or we would get a lot of people. Uh, and so most of the arguments about population and statue construction and collapse kind of connected the fact that it must have been huge numbers of populations in the island in order to, to have moved those statues. What we found when we started to study this very carefully is anything but the case. Uh, we noted that statues come in two forms. Uh, in fact, they, they go, they're in sort of two stages. Statues that are carved at the quarry called Ranuraku uh, and, and then moved across the landscape um, have a form that's, that's uh, leaning forward. Uh, incredible, you know, in fact, the statues that are, are that before they get to the Ahu, the platforms, are leaning so far forward, they actually don't stand on their own. The statues that get to the Ahu are changed in a way that makes them stand upright. Now that makes sense. If you have a statue at the Ahu that's supposed to be sitting there looking at the community, it needs to stand upright, otherwise it's gonna fall on the community and not be very useful. So it has to have a center of mass that allows it to stand. But the curious thing is that all the statues before they get there have this incredible forward lean. Um, and and that, that's something we, we, we noticed. So that, let me, uh, uh, well, here, let me just go next. What we, we did some experimentation um, with models and um, uh, trying to figure this out. And we realized for a number of lines of evidence, and there's, there's other arguments people have made, the statues must have been moved in a standing fashion, like a giant refrigerator. Now, if you think about your refrigerator in your kitchen, uh, you wouldn't lay it down on its back and put it on wheels, wheel it across the kitchen, then stand it back upright. If you wanted to move it, you could do it yourself if you just rocked it back and forth and sort of shuffled it along. Well, people have been saying this actually for quite a while. Um, uh, uh, Pavel Pavel was the most recent in 1880 in a Czech engineer uh, who argued that probably these statues were moved in a smart way, like, like you move your fridge, uh, were done in a standing fashion. So my colleague and I did it. There's a whole bunch of evidence that goes around this. Uh, but we put together, we did a, 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 a simulation. We built an actual statue, five-ton version, uh, and that modeled directly after a road statue uh, and here's what we found. So what we learned from that experiment is the fact that it, you, the statues leaning forward is actually key to their, to their movement. Um, that because they're leaning forward, every time you pull on one side or the other in a standing position, the statues take a step forward. And that's built into the physics of the construction of the statue itself. And the reason why these statues are, are leaning forward, in fact, can't stand up on their own, uh, up until the point they get to the Ahu is simply because that's the way in which you need to make them in order to move them. The challenge that the, the pop population had, the prehistoric Rapa Nui people had, wasn't a challenge of how to carve a giant statue. It was how to carve a giant statue that could actually be transported from one side of the island to the other. And the way they solved that was actually carving the statues in a way that could be walked. So when we modeled a statue, in fact, a three-dimensional perfect replica of a road statue uh, that weighed five tons and is 10 feet tall, uh, we were able to move that statue because the way prehistoric people carved it um, about 100 meters in 30 minutes uh, using just 14 people. Uh, and this is a bunch of people who really knew nothing about the, the, the coordination and the, co the collaboration required to move statues. Uh, we are basically newbies doing this. It's easily, it's easy to imagine that Rapa Nui people with long traditions of this and uh, you know investment in the training in it would be able to move things incredible long distances with hardly any people whatsoever. Uh, and that st moving the statues across the island was probably a relatively part-time and trivial thing uh, that didn't require massive numbers of people, nor any resources. The only resource that seems to be required is simply the uh, uh, the how-how, the, uh, um, uh, the plant required for rope. And we know that the, the island had that rope plant um, 
so it was certainly available. They were, you know, sailors. They had the, that kind of technology, uh, and rope would have been the only required. One of the things about the rope plant is, in fact, it grows in disturbed habitats. So as trees got were cut down to open up for farming, um, likely that created more environment for more rope. So that literally wasn't a limiting factor whatsoever. So what we've learned from the statues uh, is is um, really challenging the whole idea that it, that this required massive numbers of populations and that people got caught up in a moai mania, but rather that they, they right-sized the amount of effort uh, and resources that were available on the island in order to be able to make statue, uh, massive statues without stressing out the resources on the island per se. Uh, what we find, in fact, is that up until contact, up until European contact, uh, the island is actually a successful one in a, in a cultural sustainable community sense, uh, and that we see 500 years of successful persistence uh, of the sustainable community on a remote and tiny island with really limited resources, incredibly limited resources. All the resources that you could use on the island had to come from that island, and there were no other islands to get anything. Uh, they were able to do it entirely within the limits of, of the island itself. Uh, this is an entirely, of course, different perspective on Rapa Nui altogether, but certainly consistent with all the archaeological evidence that we've we've we found uh, that really doesn't support any of the other uh, um, suppositions that have been made. So it's this basis that we actually have to start building and under start building an evolutionary explanation. Is well, why were they successful? What is it about their way of doing stuff that allowed that way of living to be persistent over 500 years, um, where uh, in in a way that isn't necessarily intuitive to us. Uh, it certainly was successful. Uh, the question now is figuring out, well, why? So explaining the success of Rapa Nui, and here's where the evolution comes in. First, now we've described, of course, the record in such a way that we can potentially explain it. Uh, we're not resorting to the idea that this was just a crazy set of people, which of course then is, is by definition inexplicable in their behavior. We're saying this is actually something that was successful and we're looking at the long term, well, explaining the long-term persistence over time. Uh, we have to ask the question is, well, how was Rapa Nui sustainable despite its remote location and limited resources? Really, it's a very different question than what was, was asked in the past, which was, why were people crazy doing that? The answer, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is the case, is really the secret to the Rapa Nui success. The reason why they are able to be sustainable over the long run on this remote and limited place is because they had Moai. The reason why that we find so many Moai at such magnitude is simply because it was a cooperative group effort that led to well-managed shared resources with mitigated competition and benefits to all the community members at all the scales in which they interacted. In other words, the thing that was often counted as being the Moai, the mania that destroyed the population, ultimately turns out to be the secret glue that brings everybody together. A uh, completely different understanding of the island, but it totally makes sense when you think about what it would, what, why people would make statues in the first place. People wouldn't have done it over the long run if it if it was going to lead to their a decreased quality of life. It had to have provided benefits to the population at some scale, uh, and I think what we can say is at the community scale on this island, that scale is going to be particularly important. So from a multi-level perspective, is really what we need to look at. Now, a couple of things we need to ask ourselves about the island itself to understand the structure of it. Uh, why, you know, why were there such small groups with low population size? And again, we already know the answer to the soils were low in nutrients overall. Um, there just simply weren't possibility to grow lots and lots of people. You had to do with relatively few people simply because of the limits of the resources available on the island. Product, product, one of the key things about productivity on the island is that it's really patchy, both in space and time. Rainfall is fairly prevalent, in, you know, there's quite a bit of rainfall, but it doesn't happen across the island all at the same time. You'll get places 100 meters away, which are bone dry relative to other ones. Even today, when you walk across the island doing survey, you can look across the, the you know small little bay and see that it's raining on the other side. Uh, rainfall and the productivity as a result is going to be highly variable. Uh, so you have to build strategies that are able to disperse that variance to maximize the chance that you have decent uh, 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 get something out of your, your efforts. So we see selection for variance reduction. A uh, key thing in evolution, all you need to do in an evolutionary framework from, from a, you know, an actor's perspective is you need to do, do something that's good enough to survive. Um, and and uh, what's, what's sufficient to survive, uh, in this case, the challenge is going to be surviving in, in the case of variance, in the case of temporal and spatial variance. Uh, and this is particularly important on this island because, of course, there are no other options. Unlike a mainland context, where if your strategy doesn't work, you just move. On this island, you're stuck. Uh, and, and we know that from uh, evidence that um, the canoes that brought once brought them there, uh, at some point, fairly soon after people first got there, 
uh, they didn't have access to them anymore. Either they sailed away or they rotted, uh, because we can see that with the loss of uh, large pelagic fish in the, uh, fish, the fish assemblages, showing that people don't have access to deep sea fishes resources anymore, uh, really have no access to leave the island. We can see some of the variability here by just looking at some historic data and then looking at the, the requirements for plant growth. Um, and you can see one of the reasons why sweet potato probably dominate, dominated the prehistoric uh, landscape. When we look at, uh, at, at rainfall uh, over the past um, 70 years, 60 years, or something like that, um, or 40 years here, uh, that rainfall you know, is highly variable in terms of the amount of rainfall. Uh, some things like taro, sugarcane, um, the rainfall in any particular may not be sufficient to grow it. Uh, things like uh, sweet potato on the other hand tend to grow really consistently across all that. So your focus, the energy you're going to focus on is going to be on things that um, provide uh, returns regardless of the variability that you're facing uh, from rainfall. Same thing's true with, with temperature, uh, temperature variation throughout the year. Things are warm or hot. The, the one plant that grows consistently that, again, it's going to minimize variance in the, in the diurnal uh, and uh, seasonal variability a sweet potato, which which can grow basically through most of the the you know most times of the year, while other plants are going to be a lot less uh, productive. One of the things that we see um, uh, populations do in terms of their uh, cultivation practices in agriculture is simply add structures like walled gardens and things to help minimize the variance in temperature and rainfall, maximize the amount of moisture that's retained by putting walls around things, maximize the temperature or maximize, minimize the temperature variance by putting wind breaks and, and, and things that would keep uh, temperatures at least consistent over the long run, which again, pr reduces the variance in production, uh, making a more stable thing for communities to, to survive on. So the question, so those are strategies that sort of, sort of that are, are driving the population itself, variance reduction being key in that in terms of product productivity. Uh, so we have to answer the question, well, why moai? Um, you know, we could rewrite this question. What explains the magnitude and distributions of investment of monumental architecture on Rapa Nui? Because uh, it's really, you know, why Moai? We can ask that we can understand Moai, the source of Moai, uh, historically as being something that Polynesians did. In fact, from a homology perspective, uh, statue construction on Rapa Nui is consistent with other kinds of monument construction found throughout Eastern Polynesia. Uh, on, on Tahiti and in Hawaii, you call these things tiki. People call these tiki. Uh, those are wooden structures. Um, those are exactly the same thing as, as Moai on Rapa Nui, just in different forms. And the same colonists that end up in Rapa Nui are the same colonists that end up on Hawaii uh, and Tahiti and other islands uh, that are making these things. So from a historical perspective, the why question is, well, this is just what Polynesians did. The question that's the more functional question we need to ask is, well, why did they invest so much energy and so much time into making these particular things on this island? Uh, and we can see there's really not a single explanation for that, but probably two major components. And I'll, I'll talk about those two quickly. Uh, and this is sort of the evolution part. Multi-level, uh, the, the impacts of multi-level selection, sort of the group level community uh, dimension, as well as costly signaling. Uh, and probably both of these things are combined together uh, to explain the statues. And this is an area uh, that my colleague Terry Hunt and I and some of our students are working on to sort of generate the evidence to document why, a partic why particular communities are investing certain degrees of energy in particular monument construction relative to other communities to show it's actually to, to, to test the hypotheses of costly signaling and multiple suction. That so this is really uh, ongoing uh, and, and current research. Uh, so why monuments? Well, you have to think about when you think about monument construction, we can see one thing: these aren't these aren't the efforts of just an individual. You just can't do it by yourself. Um, you can make a teeny tiny one at Pocket Moai, uh, but if you're going to make a 70 ton statue that's uh, 30 feet high. Uh, you need a bunch of other people. So we have to think about the, the, the different scales at which this, this activity must have had benefits for. Uh, there must have, we think we can look at benefits at the scale of the individual. Why would you participate in such an activity yourself? Or why would any individual participate in an activity? Why would groups as a, as a whole participate in this activity? And what, what, why would the island as a whole be relative to other islands across the Pacific, be one that has so much investment in this. So sort of three scales we can sort of think about um, a monument construction that come together on Rapa Nui in a, in a particular way, leading to the outcomes that we see archeologically. So looking at the individual uh, and, and to some degree the group level, we can one, one of the areas that we've been looking at is costly signaling. Um, now costly, imagine in a community, um, uh, in a community on this island, um, you are uh, first living, you know, you're 
got a lot of neighbors. Your neighbors are likely related to you. Um, you've got to demonstrate how your access to resource, you, you're going to compete with your neighbors. You, there's no question you're going to compete with them because it's a, a landscape with finite resources uh, that's going to lead to competition by definition. So how do you how do you compete with your neighbors? Well, one way you can do that, and we see this in natural populations all the time, is simply signaling the access to resources that you have in order to avoid direct competition. In other words, you people could go to war and take things from each other, or you could signal the fact that you had access to resources to basically tell people don't do things and to, to attract the resources that you want, particularly say mates. Um, that and, and costly signaling is a strategy that we see around the, in the natural world and, and certainly explains in human behavior as ways of signaling the, the, re, the, the, the resource that you have access to um, that will um, uh, per, you know, basically avoid any direct conflict. Um, so investment in statues essentially could be explained, the statues themselves can be essentially explained as investment that individuals make in terms of their community to demonstrate their their resources as an individual to the community as well as a signal that's being sent from communities to other communities about the resources that that community has access to so there's benefits potentially at the level of both the individual in terms of participation in the group to show that you're a, a true member of the group and that you're altruistic with your interest in the group by investing in these collaborative efforts but also between groups you get benefits by by the groups demonstrating to other groups the resources they have tell people you know uh, trade with us, uh, share resources with us, or, um, or, or you know, suffer the consequences of that. So, uh, costly signal, I think, is going to be is key to this. Uh, so, we can see MOAI potentially are costly signals that provide individuals at multiple scales. At the individual scale, participating in monument construction demonstrates ingenuity and collaboration. It avoids conflict with others, peacefully channeling competition, essentially like college football, um, reinforcing group identity and prestige. Bringing the community together here is really key to the survival on this on, on this island. People need each other because, in fact, resources are limited and shortfalls are are unpredictable. Thus, that you know at some point in the future you're going to need to borrow stuff from your neighbor, so you better collaborate with them ahead of time so that you know you have those resources in the long run. It's amazing. Even today on the island, you can see this incredible degree to which people um, act in a very uh, um, are very. Are, are not willing to to sacrifice relations with their neighbors on the island simply because they know on an island like this, even in the modern day, you need each other. It's going to be a point at which you don't have something and what you need is 2,000 miles away and you're going to need that neighbor. So people are go out of their ways to make sure that they're they're making decisions that that aren't conflicting with their neighbors. Um, this this participation dimension of communityness is cer certainly seem to be the case, uh, or certainly explains well what's going on with the uh, with Rapa Nui with it, prehistoric case and with Rapa Nui. Uh, one thing we see with uh, archaeological evidence is really sort of a surprising lack of of a systematic interpersonal violence, uh, um, essentially lethal combat. Uh, we see people testing each other, uh, you know, wounds and things like that, but they tend to be non lethal. Now, in a signaling model, one of the things that's key to any signaling model is that when you signal your strength or your resources, um, there's a chance that you could be faking it. So the, the receiver of that signal has to trust that it's a true signal. One of the ways you trust that is actually you don't trust it, you test it. Uh, and, and so every once in a while, you compete with each other directly to see, is that really true? And so what we actually find archaeologically is evidence of this testing where there's interpersonal uh, interaction and violence, but not avoiding lethal combat. Now, lethal combat, you can imagine an island like this is going to be a disastrous thing. If you killed somebody's, if you killed somebody, their brothers and sisters um, live on the same island as you, and there's only 12 by 8 miles of the island for you to hide in, and you certainly can't hide for very long on an island like this. Uh, you could hide in a cave for maybe a month, but everyone knows where the caves are, um, so fighting and, and, and risking that kind of interaction is is certainly not an evolutionarily stable strategy. Uh, there's anything that will, you can do to avoid it is certainly going to be something that uh, people are going to do. And that's that definitely seems to be supported by the archaeological evidence we see on the island. Um, at the scale of groups, what we find is clans then benefit from having individuals participate in monument construction through the sharing of resources. As David Sloan Wilson has said, that you know any you know groups of individuals that act selfishly can do better than individuals that act uh, uh, altruistically, but all groups of altruists do better than groups of, uh, of selfish people. Uh, so 
at the scale of the group, those groups that cooperated more and shared more are actually going to outcompete those that don't, leading to a, select, a selection for greater investment in cooperative efforts over time. Simply put, on this island, nothing is more important than collaboration and cooperation and sharing simply because you have no alternatives. Your neighbors are your only alternatives that you have. Um, and, and people, and that res basically resulted in selection for this cooperative behavior. Groups benefit from cooperators who make, basically make everybody else better off. So that's a key part to this. On this island in particular, um, there's going to be strong, strong selection for um, uh, cooperative group levels uh, events. And we can see that directly through the MOI, which are necessarily group level uh, uh, behaviors. We, uh, this is basically multi-level selection. We can see that, you know, if you look at, uh, uh, which is it, the, um, uh, if you look at altruists in purple and versus uh, groups that have uh, 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 green, which are selfish people, uh, those groups that have more altruists are ultimately going to grow in size relative to those groups that have uh, selfish people. Uh, it's a very mathematical uh, outcome. There's really no mystery to how this occurs. Cooperation on Easter Island. Uh, really, really matters, and this is really what we see. We call this the small eye cult, but really, it's it's cooperative group efforts magnified uh, in this, you know, made particularly central to the success of this island altogether. Um, and this is how they avoid the tragedy of the commons. You imagine if you had um, cooperators and cheaters uh, making um, uh, statues. Uh, that over time we should expect to find statues, these statue consulting, going away. If if cheating, if it always paid to cheat. Essentially, uh, you would make statues for a while, but eventually the, the cheaters would outcompete those the, the, self, the altruists, and the whole thing would fall apart. Instead, on Israel, we find this persists over 500 years. Uh, statue construction seems to begin almost immediately when people get there, uh, and seem to continue all the way up until the point Europeans arrive. Um, so we, we know that the tragedy of the commons didn't happen on that one. What we get instead is probably uh, small, localized groups interacting with the competing and interacting. Oh. I'm going to just briefly, automatically, you can see that under the right conditions with small localized populations that also interact, we can see selection for continuity in uh, cooperative group efforts, despite the fact there may be all uh, uh, selfish people in that in those groups. Is there a question? Uh, well, could you could you some of that some of that? Repeat this one. There, there was a, a bit of a technical problem. Uh, you were muted for, for about 10, 15 seconds. So if you could just say what you said again, that'd be helpful. Starting with here, or the, this one? Yeah, yeah. So one of the challenges with statue construction um, would be that if you imagine you had people who were making statues started out, uh, and you had both cooperators in green or, and some cheaters, which are always going to be people who didn't bother to involve themselves in the statues, just got away with it. Uh, over time, the, the cheaters would be more successful than the individuals who uh, cooperated uh, because, in fact, they didn't have to expend any resources, food, or um, time in order to, to get the benefits of the statue. If that was the case, then over time we would find that the, the statue collectively would making activities would go away, that they would just fall apart because the selfish people would effectively outgrow in number relative to the, to the uh, altruistic people, and no one would ever bother making a statue again. But on Easter Island, in fact, we don't see that. From the get-go, when people first get to the island, we see people making statues, and then all the way up until Europeans get there 500 years later, they're still making statues. And the only way that can happen is through a configuration of, of, of multi-level selection, in which we have groups that are both uh, cooperating within the groups and interacting between the groups through both competition as well as sharing, uh, leading to uh, sustained growth of all of the groups uh, that are uh, essentially all of the groups that cooperate continue to outcompete those groups that don't cooperate. Um, and, and the way that happens is through the multi-level selection. Um, as long as there's spatial isolation, which we seem to see archeologically with localized groups making statues with some degree of sharing, over time, uh, the, those groups will persist despite the fact that there are cheaters in the group that might be free riding on the solution. Uh, allowing, which is the only way we can explain how the statues started being made when people first got there and continue to be made 500 years later. But they had to have solved that problem. Uh, otherwise, it would have, by definition, have gone away early on, simply because of the cheater uh, issue. 
So one of the things that we see about East Rhyland that's particularly interesting uh, is that really as more groups invested in sharing and uh, sort of building themselves as sustainable, all of the groups be behaved, were able to survive in a better fashion. The whole island itself benefited, all the groups on all the islands benefited because all the there was selection for each of the groups uh, to share and to uh, behave in a sustainable cooperative fashion. So we see incredible long-term solutions on an island scale uh, that allowed really everyone to, to persist over 500 years without depletion of the island's resources. So in a place where you'd expect resources at, on such a tiny, tiny place to be exploited and, and lost. In fact, on this island, we actually see uh, resources being conserved and maintained, at least the critical resources necessary for survival. One of those resources isn't, as it turns out, to be palm trees. Palm trees are actually not a particularly economically useful resource simply because they you can't make a canoe out of them, you can't make a house out of them, um, and the introduction of the of ratus exelons of the Polynesian tree rat meant that the nuts that normally are produced from them were being consumed by this uh, rodent. Uh, so, in fact, the loss of the tree forest really isn't an eco economic catastrophe. It's actually an opportunity for the population to expand sweet potato production, which is the thing that ultimately drove the economic success of the of the island as a whole. Uh, so, this benefits of the island um, really come from the fact that populations living on Rapa Nui as a whole were doing so in a sustainable fashion and were successful over the long run. So what we have is Easter Island is exactly the opposite of this story of, of failure, but actually an incredibly interesting evolutionary uh, example of how communities at community scales and, and as a sets of community scales can work together, whether they knew it or not, in a way that can lead to sustainable, sustainable practices and long run success. This requires sort of thinking about all the scales have to work here. Uh, individual scales where individuals are, are um, minimizing costs, getting benefits by minimizing costs of direct competition. Uh, within group scales where individuals benefit from group membership, essentially by investing in the group, you get benefits of being in that group, whether that's access to resources, information or mates. Uh, between group uh, benefits, essentially there's reduced violence between the groups because in fact you're signaling and allowing that information to be exchanged such that you don't have to fight each other for resources that you end up sharing by groups. And then at an island scale, as all the groups benefit from sharing and uh, conserving resources, everyone then benefits as a whole. So all of these scales have to be in place in order for the system to be sustainable. The fact that it lasted for 500 years really points to the fact that this was a, a reasonably sustainable system. Whether it would have lasted for another 500 years is uncertain, uh, but we can certainly explain why it did what it did up until the point of Europeans arriving. We can also see why it failed. The introduction of Europeans with um, new economic goods, uh, with the introduction of disease and the destruction of population, it means the whole system falls apart. All the benefits that you had by participating in the group suddenly go away, uh, and everyone abandons Mo Moai construction, which is pretty apparent from the, from the historic record, uh, and, and the island completely transforms into something different. So the conclusions here, multi-level selection explains all the group level beneficial activity. Uh, signaling leads to higher fitness overall by individuals and groups because it results in less competition between the groups, less overall interaction between the groups, essentially uh, violent interaction. Uh, cooperation of households focused on the construction of, essentially the, the, the signaling leads to cooperation of households focused on the construction of this monumental architecture. Sustainable Rapa Nui uh, comes from the individual group and island scale beneficial behaviors associated with monument construction and maintenance. We get the nice intersection between the social equity, essentially the individuals and the, the, the household scales uh, getting access to resources that they need to survive. We get the intersection of the environmental justice in the sense of the environments not being exploited uh, specifically for any particular individual or group, and the economic redistribution of resources uh, through sharing uh, due to the fact that uh, with variance, uh, sharing is going to be particularly important for long-term sustainability. So we get all the pieces that are required for uh, 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 sustainable communities. Moai, therefore, are the success secret to Rapa Nui's success. Uh, you know, ex again, exactly the opposite of what uh, is typically said. So our lessons here are, uh, well, if we want to create sustainable communities, uh, we need to be thinking about what are the things that bring those communities together? Well, first of all, we need to define what a community is. So if we're trying to create a sustainable community, say in Binghamton or in um, any part of the country, we have to think about, well, what's bringing people together uh, that they're sharing to be a community? Then we have to think about what kinds of group beneficial behaviors can you can you create that will bring people together 
uh, to serve not only the cooperative efforts with of the group itself and the sharing of information within the group, but also the between group competition uh, that will foster sort of will strengthen the benefits of the within group uh, activities. Um, there's great examples of this. Um, uh, we can use this sort of principle to actually implement things in the modern context. Uh, particularly, we need to see that in, in the conditions of unpredictability, uh, things like signaling are going to be particularly important because it helps reduce um, uh, resource use overall and helps mitigate uh, any of the variants. Essentially, you can, you know, you, you, you can, um, showing that you're, you're part of the community gives you advantages to be, gives you access to the resources in the community. And that's going to be particularly important in, in when resources are variable. So if we want to take these ideas and apply them to um, modern communities, uh, we can think about engineering things that are community events and structures. Uh, they should be com competitive and cooperative. Uh, they could be all about things like recycling, competition between neighborhoods in terms of recycling, competition between communities about composting, competitions between uh, residential halls, between waste reduction. They can be about who can learn the most about nature, uh, about health, about community service. Uh, you can link group level behavior and uh, cooperative behaviors um, together with sort of goals within your community um, uh, and create sort of competitions that produce this multi-level selection effect. We can do this at multiple scales, at family scales, individual scales, neighborhood scales, community scales, uh, government scales, cities and agencies. Uh, and we can use the lessons from East Island really directly in our own, in our own lives. <clears throat> David Sloan Wilson here in Binghamton has done basically exactly that in an experiment in, in Binghamton where he had neighborhoods um, compete over the, the design of uh, neighborhood parks um, that would bring the community together, local neighborhood scale, block level communities together, uh, have them cooperate in, in designing a park and then have those park designs um, part of a competitive process uh, leading to one a winner um, uh, in which the park is actualized. The benefits are not only to the winner for actually getting the park, but the, all, the, all the participants for in all, even the losing groups for having gone through the process of cooperating means that the, the resources and they're more likely to share resources and information in the future. Essentially, we can construct, engineer sustainable communities through implementing certain kinds of activities just like uh, our own versions of MOAI construction, so to say. So the Neighborhood Project by David Stone Wilson, um, uh, broadly speaking, um, uh, is a good example of how we can potentially do this uh, in, in the real world. Uh, so there's lots and lots of things. Um, I think there's lots and lots of areas within archaeology, like on Easter Island, that we can use uh, to, to understand ourselves and understand our future. I think we often think about the past and our evolutionary past as being somehow uh, um, you know, great tales to tell each other um, that have no import on the present. But in fact, I think it's exactly the opposite. This is the this is the area in which we can get actual knowledge about how history works that we can then use as tools for creating a future we want to have. Um, you know, we don't really have many. We have a lot of speculation about what could happen and what um, uh, you know how history does unfold. But with the history, with prehistory and history itself, we actually have the documentation of the sets of events that unfolded, and we can study that in such a way that we can generate knowledge and tools for going out and changing the future. So I think we, there's a huge potential in this area uh, that combines the strengths of the long-term record of archaeology uh, with the, the tools, the methodological and theoretical tools that come from evolution, um, broadly speaking. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Here, switch over here. Yes, yeah, so if you switch back, we can we can do some question and answers. Um, so I have dozens of things. Well, sure. not, I've got a lot that I'd like to ask you, but I think I think we'll start uh, by uh, leaving it open to the students. Can you see me? So, now? Carl, yeah, you could actually. Uh, what would be best if you just turn your screen share off? Yeah, like that. All right. Perfect. Um, so would anyone like to begin? I have a couple questions, just like technical questions about the statues, I guess. Sure. Um, so as far as getting the statues onto like the platforms, is it kind of thought that they use the same techniques with rope pulling to get them up? Yeah, they, here's my little statue. <laughs> they, um, they said, we, we did this in our experiment. You could actually walk, it's actually easy to go uphill because when you take a step on each side, 
essentially you can um, each step you can go up and it'll still fall forward so essentially the statues are falling when you tilt it they fall forward and and take a step so going up actually wasn't isn't very hard the hard part actually is going down because you're leaning already leaning forward and it wants to fall over so one we something i need to some someday we need to create another one um they may be walking them backwards downhill uh, because, huh. because of the angle uh, and, and in fact downhill isn't, isn't too hard even if they did fall over you can once you can stand it back upright if you're going downhill uh so that it isn't a big challenge uh, as long as you can break but yeah they, they probably just walk them up the hill um they we have evidence of the ramps that they constructed um essentially they they built ramps in front of the yahoo and then deconstructed the ramps and made put them in the wings of the Ahu. So if you actually look from aerial photographs, you'll see there's a, a central platform with a with a, a bank in front of it. But on the sides are big piles of rocks, uh, and and it, those are probably the rocks that were used as the ramp that they get reused to the side of the statue of the of the Ahu. Gotcha. And then so with like the technique of the rope pulling, it's very like physics e so is there evidence like of them using kind of like physics like thought processes or do you think it was mostly like trial and error and now we can kind of look at it as physics probably both in the sense of um you know physics is our formalization of our knowledge they their knowledge included aspects of that they must have known about center of mass for example mm -hmm. that if you carve a statue's belly too much at some point, it'll fall. It, it won't be able to fall forward anymore. You know, mm -hmm. they they knew that it was within their own context. But we do see experimentation. So at the at the uh, quarry, there's a quarry called uh, Rana Raku. There's about 600 statues at the quarry in all states of being constructed, from just the beginning of the face to the body to ones that are on the ground to ones that are in the the ones that you just see the heads. Um, all of those are statues. Those all look like th them trying different things. Yeah. You know, because one of the things about building, carving a statue is that as you carved it out of the bedrock, if a piece of the statue fell off, and this, this st stone isn't particularly hard, it's called a, it's a volcanic tuff, a compressed ash, chunks of it will fall off, but you can't stick anything back on. Mm -hmm. So so if it if the balance got off, you, you just had to leave it. You'd just be like, oh, well, we're never going to move this one. And, <laughs> and I think that's what a lot of the statues that are at the quarry are simply efforts to build stuff that then they're like, ah, screw this. We're, you know, like let's start another one, you know, because, uh, because it, you know, there's certain unpredictability there. So, uh, you, so you see sort of all the stages at which they started making things and then for whatever reason abandoned it, uh, where they were experimenting with different kinds of shapes and forms. Uh, cause one of the things that you see in the statues, the ones that are transported is that once they figured it out, everything starts to look more and more alike, you know, this classic form of the statues simply become comes, the way in which you need to make a statue that can be moved. They have sort of a bowling pin shape, sort of this tall head, where the head starts to get elongated. The bigger and bigger they get, the taller the head gets. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens is they figured out the solution and then all of the statues started to look more and more alike simply because that's the way you make a, a statue that can be moved. Uh, and that gets increasingly important as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. There are fewer choices. Uh, so we can definitely see it's an experiment, a bit of experiment and then knowledge that's generated over time. Gotcha. Um, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about there's, you described this sort of like funny balance between conflict and competition, huh? right? Because on, and, and on, on different levels, right? Because on one level there, you made the claim that cooperating and making these statues reduces individual conflict reduces violence potentially yeah. Yeah. but on the other level on, on another level it's it's increasing conflict or, or channeling it right so you, so they're you're you're saying that there are groups of statue builders that are potentially competing for prestige yeah. we you think about how that like i mean it doesn't have to be this way but it seems like it it turned out this way that you've mm -hmm. got each so you got I mean people are each group seems to be tied very much to the local resource in which they're living like it's amazing how localized uh, genetically and stylistically the artifacts are like the, the the genetics of the people as well as the the uh, the artifacts that they don't seem to go very like their entire lives may be 
going about 500 meters from their house. Like you, you'd think on an island that that small, people would randomly move across the island, but they don't because in fact, the, sh the rest of the island, any part of the island is identical to any other part of the island. And people tend to stay near home. So, so there is this sort of localization that's occurring that just happens creating sort of groupness to begin with just because of the local nature of the resources. But the, the so, but at the same time, um, there's going to be competition over certain kinds of resources, like mates in particular, where where there are finite resources island wide, and you want access to them. How are you going to claim yours? Right? There's it, it's it's going to be the nature of any finite space in which there's going to be some kind of competition. So if competition is channeled into this particular between group competition ways, it means one as an individual you avoid the the cost of the competition directly. Uh, but also means that it um, drives the innovation in in the, the the ways in which you solve the cooperation in the first place. So it has benefit evolutionary <clears throat> evolutionary beneficial effects <clears throat> by being an engine of innovation that then drives more sustainable communities. Essentially, the communities that demonstrate they can do better end up being those that are better. That then drives for increasing share. You know, copying of those that then drives the whole island. So it creates. I think. The combinations of, of cooperation and the competition create the, the right context for producing the variability that has the long-term sustainability consequence. Because if you didn't have the competition, you wouldn't have the need to innovate new things to show off with mm -hmm. or innovate new ways of surviving under unanticipated shortfalls, right? This provides the innovation engine that's needed in this kind of environment. Um, so, it, you know, and again, I, I, the competition is, is, is also the other, you know, the other aspect of this is that competition is going to happen anyways. The question is, how do you, how do you channel that competition? How do you make it in such a way that it doesn't hurt you? And I think this is, and generally speaking, in human populations, we want to avoid, we do everything we can to avoid direct violent competition. Uh, you know, I think the, I, the idea of warfare um, is, is we, we look at past peoples and we often assume a lot of warfare. I think a lot of the warfare stuff we tend to see is actually just showy stuff that happens for people to rattle sabers to avoid actually doing the things that they do. It isn't until you get really long distance ballistics that you start to see real serious warfare, right? When you get bow and arrow or guns, you can start to kill people without a very marginal cost to you. But when you're throwing rocks at people's heads like they were in Rapa Nui, you know, the chances of you missing and then them throwing a rock at your head is really high. So you're going to do everything you possibly can to avoid the actual competition. So I think there's a lot of selection for finding alternatives to any kind of competition that's occurring there, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in these kinds of environments where if you, if say you did kill somebody, then you're still going to pay the cost eventually because of their relatives are on the island and the same island as you. It's like you, you can't avoid paying the cost. So your better strategy is to never do it in the first place. And that doesn't mean that people don't try. People are people, right? You, you know. Right. There's always variance, but overall, in a population wide, you find remarkably little amounts of interpersonal violence or lethal violence. So you you use the example briefly of of modern sports teams, yeah, right, as as a, a a similar example to this. And I guess the another example that that popped up into in my head are um, was just like the neuron development in the brain that you have like this sort of like competitive process during during toddlerhood that that produces you know neuronal weeding or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I I, I want to I'd love to be able to talk more generally about this process. Uh, and you you've done a pretty good job of it. Um, but so I'm I'm trying to to frame frame a question in this. But like what what is it about about nesting these levels that can can create competition and make it productive Wait, I mean you know this is David talks a lot about you know in his model he always assumes the nature of the groups but in reality groupness isn't something that has to emerge out of the interactions of individuals you have to create the groups right groups we can all we can look back and say those were the groups but from a practical perspective you imagine you know you're living in a commune of people you're, you're really always on a daily basis forging the groupness through Things that you create, events, dinners, you know, the, those it is there's no actual empirical group until it's until it's happened. It's just a concept. So these events essentially create the groupness upon which then multi-level selection can happen. You have to, those have to be engineered to happen. Because of course we're we're free not to do it at any point in time, right? So that's I think where the those, you know, we can see this empirically. I, actually, I should say, 
we should be able to see this empirically, those communities that say have strong sports team identities probably outcompete, generally speaking, those that don't, right? Well, you know, in Binghamton, for example, we don't have a football team. It's interesting when, when the community roots, it's for the, 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 um, the Little League World Series main end well sports team is the team that is the team that's most recognizable as a community. I think that hurts our community because we don't have the community ness of the sports team to bring anything together, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to engineer those, right? So we we the neighborhood project is a good example. We could we could start to market more you know, university sports teams or other kinds of groups. You know that it, it, we don't have to let them. They don't have to pre exist to make them happen. We have to think about those are necessary though in order to start with a community to create a community that then you can create shape to be sustainable. The lack of community, lack of groupness is the big challenge to multi-level selection. If you don't have groups, you're never going to get multi-level selection, right? You've got to somehow accidentally or historically or artificially engineer that groupness to have something to work with, right? I mean, I just read a paper. I, I was in Coco. They were talking about how like um, accidental population density creates the conditions for multi-level selection. I mean, that, that can, you know, just the, the, the sheer spatial propinquity of agents together can create the conditions leading to, to multi-level selection that you don't you know that, that it happens all the time but the question is from our perspective if we're thinking about our own future what is the groupness we want to have in order to to be able to engineer that to be sustainable within the scale that we want it to be sustainable in does that make sense yeah um so is there in in the can you date the statues like is do you see them changing over time like getting more you, you hinted at this that they become taller but yeah. like is there unfortunately i mean it's it's really tough it's a big challenge and, and we need to just technologically how to date a rock is hard because what what's the when you date something you're dating the event an event so when mm -hmm. did the, when did the statue separate from the quarry would be the event but how do you date that like so Cosmic rays are one way to do that. Like, but anyways, it's complicated. Uh, but what we do know is that statues, statues have a lifespan. They end up on Ahu, and then over time, these are basically giant rocks piled on other rocks. And then over time, um, with earthquakes and everything, they fall over and they break. And over the course of the 500 years, statues that w were once on top of this of the Ahu fall, break, and then are reincorporated back into the Ahu as just rubble. So when we look at those stat those statues when when Ahu are deconstructed, like Tongariki is a good example. In 1968, a tsunami destroyed it. 1960, a tsunami destroyed it. Um, and it basically disassembled the entire Ahu. Inside the Ahu were all these Moai heads. And they're all these weird old shapes. See, and we know they're early because they were inside it, right? Because over time. So, um, what we find is that there's a lot of variability early on. So a lot of signaling going on in terms of making statues that's very localized. But over time, um, they start to collapse into a form that looks like the, the one. So all the ones that you see um, it, typically in the videos and stuff all have these long heads. Those tend to be the later statues. So we can kind of use that as a scaling mechanism. And as a result, we can kind of say that we can definitely see that over time, statues tend to get, I should say, the, the, uh, the max size gets bigger. There's always more statues they're more they're variable they can be small and large but they're more bigger ones as you get as they get more recent so we know that there's greater investment of statues over time uh, and then all those big ones start to look more and more like this simply because that's the mechanism by which you can move them as they get bigger you can't move them any other way than walking mm -hmm. so we have a little bit of knowledge about the history uh, but it's an important problem I mean it's, it's an area where we need to do a lot more work to try to figure out how do we even date these things specifically it's a, ch it's a challenge but even what you just said, I mean, that seems like there's clear evidence for selection. Oh, yeah. Definitely. What's not clear is, like, you know, what's being selected or, you know, what the criteria are. But if, but if there's a trend like that, you know, yeah. then. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's why I think this costly signaling makes sense is that there's essentially a grammar of costly signaling that emerges that's part of competition because everyone starts to do it the same kinds of ways. And, and essentially the grammar is how you signal your resources, like the shape. Like you can't make the statue however you want because it has to look like something that competes with something else that someone's doing, right? And that's selection. Selection is saying that 
this is the way in which you convey your signal to the other competitors through a form that looks like, is a variant of this form. If you made something that was, say, a giant sphere and you rolled it around, no one would know what that meant, right? Mm. <laughs> in the grammar, you could do it, but obviously, and they could have done it, but they didn't because it wouldn't have meant anything. So that, that really, to me, suggests that there's selection for the way in which competition's uh, un unfolding uh, mm. between communities. That's a lot, I mean, a lot more to work to do. I mean, the cool thing is I think we now have like the base, enough of the understanding to say, to ask meaningful questions. That's always been the challenge is if we treat it as like, that's weird, then you can't really ask any questions about like, well, why would anybody do a weird thing? Because your answers are whatever, like, because they were crazy, right? That be, but now we can say, no, that this had to have made sense. It served these functional roles. And the question is, well, why did it unroll this particular way here? Uh, and, and we can do the same thing with other kinds of archaeological evidence, uh, big mound construction, pyramid construction. A lot of these things have similar kinds of group level benefits that probably make more sense in terms of the benefits that serve the community uh, than being like the will of the pharaoh or, you know, the crazy idea of some ruler, which is all study mounds as well, right? What is not you were you were recently in Louisiana? Louisiana, yeah. So in Louisiana we see very similar hunter gatherer groups coming together low density populations producing massive earthen monuments, uh, basically inexplicable. Like why would they possibly do that? But we see that they're on the fringes of, of a resource distribution where it makes sense for communities to get together to share information and resources. And that, that particular combination of stuff creates the conditions for, for community scale beneficial behaviors. So I'd love to hear a bit more from the students. Um, I'll just call on someone. Uh, Nuang, is there any, any questions you have? Yeah. Um, before we talked about how you, you asked a question about how um, these monuments could be made as a form of competition between groups. Yeah. Um, but then you also showed that diagram where it was like, instead of um, artifacts being found clustered together, they're like spread out on the island. Wouldn't that doesn't that indicate that like the population itself is spread out and not in, yeah. in like general areas? It's good. That's a good point. So archaeologically, we call those, I mean, you know, a lot of our communities that we see today, we think about them as called nucleated communities, communities, that, you know, classic Neolithic village um, is, you know, everyone in the town lives in a town and then they go out to the landscape to get their farm and they come together and they work in the town. Um, East Rowan, and like many other parts of the world and other times, live in a dispersed community system where essentially your district, the community itself is scattered across the landscape. What what brings the challenge with a dispersed community is that you how do you share information? Like if everyone lives across, you know, say a couple of kilometers space and they're doing their local sweet potato farming thing, how do you share information and resources? The, the statues and the ahu seem to be the thing that brings people back together again. So on some seasonal, regular basis, people go back to the ahu, collaborate in these events, and then go back out to their farming to do their, their farming thing. So it, it's, it's, a, it's, the, it's sort of the magnet that pulls the community back together again. And this is why, if you look along the coast, you see ahu, you know, dispersed stuff, ahu, like a repetitive ahu all along the coast. There's you know, hundreds of these ahu the statues. And it's because each of those is a community that's, and, and those are the points that the community is coming back together again to collaborate because that's the essential glue that brings, keeps that dispersed community together. The more dispersed you are, the more important it is to have a central location to bring you back together again. I mean, we see, we see examples of this all over the place. Uh, um, like in, in Europe, uh, the construction of cathedrals, for example, are essentially ways of bringing a community back together again through collaborative activities. And they serve to bind that community together to give them, you know, some sustainability. And it's, it's no accident, sort of, if you look at the distribution of them, they tend to be uh, northerly distributed where these kinds of cathedral construction happens because that's the place where it matters the most to collaborate together. Uh, they're very similar to Ahu. We just, you know, we call them churches, but in fact, they're, they're exactly the same kinds of things and serve the same kinds of functions, at least from the community, at the community scale. All right. Yeah. So um, then we also talked about like the the general shape or the evolution of the the shape of the Yahoo. Huh? 
Um, would that also play into the culture of like the people who live there? Like, I don't, I don't understand how the the shape of it developed. Like, also to the fact that like some of them have hats. You said, yeah. Like, is that the stylistic choices of like the group that made the ahu like? of each ahu, like why is there a difference between like a hatted one and like a not hatted one? Well, that, that's a good question about the hats. Hats, we, there are about 70 hats, Pukau. Um, and yeah, obviously there's a lot more statues. Hats appear to be a late thing. So it, it, and the best way I can think of it, I, you know, again, we don't really know because the timing is so poorly understood, but it, it seems to be like, not only did we make a statue, but we put this giant hat on it. Like it's sort of a way of topping other people's, you know, in the competitive sense, that it, you know, fit culturally in a sense that clearly at contact, we know that headgear was really important to Rapa Nui people. Like it has this cultural significance. And so adding a hat is part of cultural tradition. But I think adding those giant pukau, which are ultimately multi ton things, was sort of the way of saying, look at our signal. You built a statue, but we put a giant hat on top of it, it was an additional way of signaling that particular, in, in a culturally appropriate way. But they definitely look like late things because you see, you see early statues without hats that have flat he top heads. They're they're very unlike this one. Um, they have uh, they're very flat on top, and so it's a, it, it's likely that they're putting something on top that that doesn't preserve, like basket of food or something like that. In fact, Rogovine talks about seeing baskets on the tops of some statues, um, but we don't have any ethnographic evidence of that. Uh, but it's likely that there's something going on on the tops of statues, lots of them, and that some of them at some point in time, probably late, start to get added on the stone versions of those things, simply as part of the signaling, as the signaling sort of it grows and grows over time. Do you have any idea how they got the Pukau on top? Yeah, we're working, that, actually it's a paper we're, we're just finishing editing, literally yesterday. Uh, our, our best knowledge, when we look at, I mean, it's, it's real, Pukau, the statues, there are a lot of them. So we had a lot of examples to look at in terms of the shapes and the forms and the wear and how they broke and stuff like that. And that gives a lot of evidence, direct evidence about transportation. Pukau are tough because they're giant wheels of this rock that falls apart pretty easily. So, so it's tough and there are only 70 of them and they're all portions. But our best evidence is that they use, essentially once they, so they walk it up, they get it to the top of the ramp, um, and, and then they have to, one of the problems is the statue, once it gets to the top of the ramp, is leaning forward, right? It's it's built to fall over. Well, they have to change that so it stands upright. And the way to do that, they have to remove material at the base of the statue in order to set it back. And in fact, we see evidence of that. Uh, when you look at the bases of statues that are Ahu, you actually find two surfaces. The original surface, that was the front edge where it used to walk on, and then the new surface after they cut the heel of the statue out so it stands upright. When they're doing this, when they're cutting the heel out, what we see, what we believe is that the, there's a ramp that's holding the statue up. That's when they wheel the, the pukau up. Uh, they basically, they use a parbuckle technique. And we have evidence of grooves where they're basically having a, a, a line around um, the, um, so here's the pukau. Um, and uh, they wheel, they pull it up uh, using what's called parbuckling. Uh, and then they get it to the top and they drop it down on top of the statue and then they lean the statue back upright Now one of the reasons we know that is because there's actually they actually notch the inside of the of the pukau With a slot to fit on the head of the statue. So when it tips up it stays with the head um, So it's it's part of the process of finishing the statue is how they get the, the pukau on top of it They're tied together. And that's why, probably why we don't see pukau on all the statues because they you could only do it at one that wasn't finished. They hadn't put up yet. You could only do it on the uh, as you were putting it up. So once it's up, you couldn't get the pukau up there. That's so cool. <laughs> Crazy cool stuff, you know. I have a final question. Sure. So, um, if they built these monuments in order to like, control uh, cooperation amongst the people. Um, are we assuming that in in the artifacts found there aren't a lot of like weapons? Yeah, there, that's something we did research on. There are things called mata'a. Uh, these are uh, stone 
uh, hafted obsidian objects that have been called spears. You find thousands and thousands and thousands across the island. Um, they've been called weapons. Uh, and that's been often the evidence of the collapse saying like, oh, look at all those weapons. Those, those are the weapons that people use to kill each other. Well, we've done analysis on the wear patterns of those, the shapes of them. We've looked at a lot of different dimensions. And it's really clear that they're, they're, there's no way they were lethal. Uh, a lethal thing, if, if you think about, if you think about the sort of evolutionary or the, even the game theory dimension of lethal combat. If you're going to try to kill somebody, you're going to make the most lethal thing you possibly can because if you didn't kill them at that point, they're going to come after you, right? You better get them then, otherwise you're in trouble. So what we find is the fact that these things aren't pointy. <laughs> and if you're going to kill somebody with a with a sharp stick, um uh, you're going to make it, you need to get it into the internal organs so that you can kill the person. So if you don't make it long and pointy, it's going to not be very lethal. So these things, what we find are actually randomly shaped uh, that are not pointy whatsoever uh, and aren't thin and, and certainly would serve no purpose as a lethal weapon. So what we actually, all the evidence points to the fact they're farming implements. They're used for cutting, uh, cutting uh, sweet potato um, uh, chunks that you can replant sweet potatoes and scraping things, stuff like that. Uh, and, and where we find them is consistent with uh, cultivation techniques. So again, it's another thing that people assumed as being evidence of this collapse. But when you really look at it in detail, there's just simply no evidence that would be the case. And there must be carving implements, right? Like how do they cut stone, but with harder stone? Yeah, so they use basalt, slightly harder versions of basalt uh, to, to make the obsidian tools. There's volcanic glass on the island. Uh, mm -hmm. so they make adzes out of, out of basalt. You know, it's a sort of slightly ver slight variance of different volcanic rocks with different densities to make other rocks. Cool. So they could they could have done it. They could have made long spear type things out of glass, but there, you know it doesn't seem none of the forms look like that at all. Um, so he, most of the evidence that you're describing, right, and then the research that you do, it, it's it's archaeological. Like you're you're looking at at rocks and patterns and things. Um, have are you aware? I mean, is there possible to get cultural like story data from from the people that still live on the island about the way about the practices associated with this? Like, I mean, it seems like it's kind of a black box. It, it's it's tough. I mean, oral traditions. There's actually some interesting ways you might use the oral traditions, um, but they're tough because oral traditions were collected by anthropologists in the early 20th century. So uh, probably the you know most systematic first systematic recording of oral traditions comes from uh, Catherine Rutledge in 1917. Of course, Europeans first get there in 1722, and populations collapsed down to 111 by 1877. So what you get in 1917 is a tiny, tiny fraction, a random fraction of stuff that has to do with the past, the prehistoric past. What you get is a lot of stuff that's introduced during the historic times, and it's hard to distinguish what's what. So it's a big mess. But in there, of course, there's a lot of interesting stories. And what's amazing is the fact, what I find is fascinating about it is that there's a lot of things in the traditions um, that are probably, definitely probably, Oral traditions in Polynesia in general are really important. Uh, and on Rapa Nui seem to be particularly important. We actually find a, a writing system on Rapa Nui called the Rongo Rongo script. It's known mostly, it's all it's all known entirely from um, wood carvings uh, that are mostly dated to the to historic times, the 19th century. Uh, but it's pretty sophisticated. It's not just, um, you know, drawings of birds and fish. They're actually glyphs of some sort, un, unre unread. And one of the arguments about them is that they're, they're a script for telling stories. And that, and this kind of makes sense. And when you think about the the nature of this island, where um, how do you maximize? Uh, actually, this came from study uh, reading one of Turchin's book uh, about um, the conditions. The 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 more ideas that you retain, the more likely you're able to survive the long fall of the the, the problems in the long run. Right? You know, imagine the challenge here is it's a tiny population living on an island where. This, the knowledge existing within that population is, is a tiny, is only going to reflect a short period of time relative to the long term of the island itself. There's going to be strong selection for keeping oral traditions alive on islands because that's the way you expand the innovative body of knowledge that allows you to succeed in conditions that you've never personally experienced. Right? Mm -hmm. Storytelling matters to past populations because that's the way in which they could pre understand conditions they never experienced. On islands like this, where you have great shortfalls that no one may have experienced, um, it's going to be particularly important, right? Because you don't, 
there aren't enough people. There's no way of keeping that not knowledge alive within a small set of people unless you have mechanisms for keeping the oral traditions. So what's interesting is I think there are strong oral traditions and that we're seeing the effect of selection on keeping those oral traditions. The problem is that the content of those traditions may or may not be accurate for what they did in the past. It's hard to tell. So what we, the best we can do probably is say, try to explain the content of the oral tradition as being either, an inter, you know, is this an introduction of the present, of the historic times, which some of it is. Many of the anthropologists of the, of the time in which they collected it said, oh, this is most likely a recent introduction of events that happened in the past 50 years. Um, or is it something that reflects the deep past? For example, the walking story, um, there is an oral tradition, in fact, songs, uh, and we've actually recorded some, of walking the statues. They talk about the statue walk down the road, and there's an oral tradition of this that Europeans largely ignored and said, oh yeah, walking, ha ha ha. You know, that's ethnographic storytelling. But in fact, that's actually preserved in the oral traditions. What it seems now is that we can now explain that that existence of that as being, that's a remnant of, probably a remnant of prehistoric tradition. Um, but there's, at the same time, there's also other traditions about the way the statues moved around uh, that, you know, who knows where they've come from? So you can kind of, unfortunately, you can mine almost anything you want out of oral traditions, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you want to tell. But I think what's cool is that the oral traditions, I think, really demonstrate the selection for the conditions that they were facing about knowledge retention to deal with shortfalls over the long run. And we probably could look at, in a comparative sense, to show why it mattered most, you know, on, on Rapa Nui more than anywhere else. Well, we're nearing the end of our class period. Are there any final questions? I uh, have one. Yeah. Um, so, like, we talked about how, like, they have the bowling ball pin shaped statues on Easter Island, and then you have tiki's in Hawaii. Yeah. And you said, like, that's just what Polynesians did. Yeah. Like, is build, like, these huge statues, but like why that so like in other cultures like you said like there's churches or there's other big monuments is there any particular reason or a theory behind like why they chose these kind of like not human looking but i mean they had faces so in a way almost human looking huge statues like i mean polynesia you can trace you can trace uh in polynesia the idea of statues back to western polynesia and in, in melanesia um where, in fact, there's a tradition within Western Polynesia, which was occupied first, in giant stone uprights. They're not even, there's no human figures at all. They're just big slabs of rocks. And they, these slabs of rocks are often put on rectangular platforms. And they're, they're honored as ancestors, essentially the representations of ancestors. Okay. So that tradition of big stone upright actually has an early origin in Polynesia. Uh, in fact, that even goes to East Asia, like, you know, early occupied 30,000 years ago. So it's a long-term historical tradition that's clearly embedded in the traditions of Polynesians, broadly speaking, that the that essentially, you imagine you've got a founder's effect of populations coming from central Polynesia, going to each of these islands, bringing their version of those traditions to each of those islands. So while they're similar to all the other islands, they're gonna be slightly different in form depending on which family and which clan got in the canoes to get to those islands. So they're gonna be sort of idiosyncrasies that emerge across the space, uh, as well as sort of divergence, they're historic, about the form that those take. So on Easter Island, for example, the stone uprights are brought in the form of stone statues. And those then get, uh, you know, sort of that lineage gets amplified and reinvented and built up. On other islands, you see stone statues. Actually in, in the Austral Islands, um, the island of uh, the Marquesas, even on islands uh, in the northwest chain of Hawaii, you actually find stone statues as well, human figurines. Uh, they're smaller in scale. And part of that comes from the fact that the, the sort of community scale cooperative advantage of making giant monuments, there isn't selection for that kind of thing on these other islands, partly because the nature of the resources are wildly different. In central Polynesia, it's more like your classic Polynesia with bananas and coconuts falling from the trees and you're not needing um, to, to, you know, you're not struggling as much as, as these mar more marginal parts of the Pacific. So, so we actually see these kinds of versions of these things appear. It's really consistent with the rest of Polynesia. Just on Easter Island, they start small, but then they, because they become so important, um, 
they we get lots of them. And because they're so important at the community scale, they get larger and larger and larger. Where on the other islands, they just that just doesn't happen. That narrative never takes place. Other parts of the Polynesia, for example, in uh, the Austral Islands, there are there is no statue construction at all. <coughs> there, it actually pays off to go to war. So on in um, the island of Rapa, which is in the southern part of the Australs, instead of cooperative effort at the scale of well signaling and cooperative effort. Uh, uh, in the way we see Rapa Nui, we actually find hilltop fortresses where everyone goes to the tops of hills and then throws rocks at each other to take over their land. Uh, a very different solution. Same exact people, same time, same you know cultural traditions, but because of the environmental conditions and constraints, wildly different outcomes. It's really evolution, the result of evolution in these very different places, but same sort of homologous uh, uh, background. Well, so when you describe it like that, it makes me wonder, like, how much how much of these different outcomes are due to to like adaptation to the environment, and how much of it is just drift? Like, you know, you can you can land on a cooperative yeah. solution or a competitive solution, and then both are stable once you get to the extreme. It's a it's a good question. I mean, you know, probably both, right? There's there's unique conditions in the environment, and then you could like Austral Islands are same latitude, um, so it's southerly, uh, but you get uh, irrigated taro fields. So irrigated taro fields are essentially very, very productive where each square foot of the ground that you can grow ir taro in is something worth defending. On Easter Island, you have the soils are never very productive. So there's no point in defending it. So people don't bother fighting over it in the first place. So you get, so, you know, the there, it seems like the constraints lead to very different outcomes because there's just no point in, in fighting over Rapa Nui land. And there's really no, and it really, the land on, on, on Rapa is too important to, to not fight over, right? So mm. very different outcomes. But drift could be part of this too. I mean, there's certainly dimensions of drift that have got to be the case. Because well, they're, right. got they're tiny not with each other either. They're, once they get to these sort of margins, there's a bit of interaction, but because in fact, the language, they're still, the languages are somewhat intelligible at, even now. Like a Hawaiian can understand some words of Rapa Nui. Rapa Nui people can understand Austra Austral, but there's, there's enough differences where it's not seamless. So there's some interaction, some history, but a bunch of isolation and drift. Well, thank you very much. This was, this was really uh, it was great. It was fantastic. I think it went really well. Good. Um, so the this is this is our last class of the semester, and the way that it'll work is you know, sometime next week I'll send you an email with links to all the videos that everybody makes of your talk. Um, okay. So that'll, that'll be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks thanks so much for, okay. for joining anyway, us. Any questions, send, feel free to send me an email if any questions come up. Thank cool. you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I usually chat with the students a little bit before the end. So Carl, if you sign out, I'll. Yeah. Okay. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye.